Vera and I share this lecture. I will start with an introduction and then Vera will continue and present some letters of Zunz and Rappaport. Zunz and Rappaport had correspondence over a long period of time on many different issues. Isaac Weiss Hirsch writes on the di scientific dialogue between Zunz and Rappaport, quote, Rappaport explicitly refers to Zunz whose arguments he attempts to refute, quote end. In our paper, we will show that it was Zunz who consulted Rappaport on questions of rabbinic literature, and we will prove this with the uh, discussion about the, uh, the dating of the Yalkut Shimoni, a comprehensive commentary on the Tanakh. We are honored to present this lecture on August the 10th, which is the birthday of Leopold Zunz. In 5068, the Yechaim, Kalonimos ben Jakob completed the only surviving manuscript of the Yalkut Shimoni. He closed the manuscript writing, quote, I, Kalonimos, the younger, the son of Rabbi Jakob, let his rest be in the Garden of Eden, have written this book of the notebook of Rav Shim on Hardashan, the memory of the righteous be a blessing about the five books of the Torah, for the pious Rabbi Nathan Harpanas, son of Rabbi Chaim, who may live. And I finished it here on Shabbat, on the fifth of the month of Tevet, in Chaim, in the city of Rodenburg Tauber, by the river Tauber. Quote end. The printers of the first edition of the Yalkut on the Torah, Salonika 1526, also mentioned Shimon Hardashan at the end of the book, and 1566, the Venice edition added, that Shimon originated from Frankfurt. In 1832, in his Die Gottesdienstlichen Vorträge der Juden, Leopold Zunz had dated the Yalkut Shimoni to the 13th century, and Salomo Rappaport had argued for the 11th century in 1843 in Kerem Chemet 7. Zunz had praised Rappaport in his introduction of the Gottesdienstliche Vorträge, quote, not only for the inexhaustible in instruction that his printed writings have given me, but also for the three years of correspondence that have been so beneficial to my research in many respects." Quote end. In chapter 18 of his Gottesdienstliche Vorträge, Zunz placed the Yalkut after the time of Rashi, firstly because he assumed that he would have used the Yalkut if it were available to him, secondly because the Yalkut refers to Midrashim, which were written after the time of Rashi, and thirdly because there is no evidence for the existence of the Yalkut in the 12th century. The earliest reference to the Al-Qud provides Abraham Abu Lafia. Therefore, Zunz identified the order of the Al-Qud with Shim Onkara, quote, who lived in the southern Germany a little more than 600 years ago. In 1843, Rappaport stated that passages of younger Mitrashim as Shmutraba and Avkir in the Yalkut can be found either in Tranhuma, the Yerushalmi, or the Bavli. Therefore, the author could have lived in the time of Rashi or prior to it. Rashi had indeed worked with the Yalkut Shimoni and occasionally indicated this by referring to a uh, Rabbi Shimon. In order to closer identify this Shimon, Rappaport referred, referred to Luriat's Teshuvah number 29, what is the genealogical order of the Geonim and the authors who used their, their works, where he mentioned two Shimons, Shimon Hagadol bar Isaac and two Rabbeinu Shimon of Mainz, author of the Asara, Ata Hinralta Torale Amecha. According to Rappaport, Luria mentioned Shimon bar Yitzchak, who was famous for his piyutim close to Shimon of Mainz, because he composed the Atar in Ralta. Quote, which is also a Yalkut, for he gathered all the commandments of the Torah and of the sages according to the order of the commandments of the Halachot Gedolot, according to the Hebrew alphabet. Quote, end. 
From this period, Rappaport deduced hints to the time of the period's author from its allusion to Abraham's vision in Pirke de Rabbi Eliezer, chapter 28. Quote, the birds of prey came down. This is David at sunrise. He would wave at them so that the eagle shall not rule over them until the evening to announce that they won't rule but one day of the days of the creator of mountains excluded two thirds of an hour during the time when the sun turns west, quote end. Psalm 19.4 states, for in your sight, a thousand years are like yesterday that has passed like a watch of the night Therefore, the 12 hours of the night correspond to a thousand heavenly years. According to Rappaport, the Paitan of Atar Hinchalta began counting the thousand years of Israel's oppression, the eagle is a symbol for Rome, with the beginning of the destruction of the Second Temple. To, cal to calculate the end of the oppression, two thirds of an hour have to be subtracted. And now comes the myth, which Rappaport does not explain. Therefore, I skip it too. But he concludes, quote, If we deduct two-thirds of an hour, which comes to 28 years of thousand, we will be left with 972 after the destruction of the temple. The four will be a surplus to 4,800, and that year was implied by the Paitan, and he wrote his period a few years before that, at the time of Gershom ben Yehuda, his contemporary. Quote end. According to Rappaport, the destruction of the temple falls in the year uh, 3832, to which he added 972 years, which is 4,804, with a surplus of 4 to 4,800. Luria mentioned that Rashi was born in the year 4,800, in which Gershom ben Yehuda died. In this time, Shimon of Mainz lived, who composed the Biot Atar in Chalta and the Yalkut. This Shimon is father of Yosef, whom Rashbam called on Bereshit 2460, Joseph, the son of Shimon Kara, who is also the brother of Menachem Chelbo. After Rappaport's publication, Zunz wrote in his Zur Geschichte der Literatur, page 61, in 1845, quote, Shimon Kara, the brother of Menachem ben Chelbo, is the author of a midrash cited by Rashi and, according to Rappaport, identical with Shimon Hadarshan, the author of the Yalkut. Thank you. As Dagmar has already mentioned, the Moravian scholar Isaac Hirsch Weiss was a harsh opponent of Rappaport. In his short biography of Zunz, he wrote 1895. I feel no hesitation in affirming that Tun's life of Rashi acted as an incentive to Rappaport to try uh, his hand at work of a similar character. Anyone who penetrates into the spirits in these articles of Rappaport will recognize that Tun's method served considerably modified, however, as Rappaport's guide. It is ridiculous to suppose that both savants hit on the same plans independently of one another. For when Rappaport wrote his biographies, he had already before him Tsun's life of Rashi. Quote end. The fights carried out in the printed media during the 19th century were caused by religious, cultural, and political discrepancies. Indeed, arguments ad hominem obscured further the scientific discussions. The discourse on Yalkochimoni was there no exception, and it is important to separate the research on the medieval sources from the personal bias which Rapoport and Tsun's met. Weiss ignored the simple fact that Tsunz saw Rappaport as a friend and a mentor. This uh, can be proved in their letters. Both had, despite of their very different lives, methods of working and even religious opinions a lot in common. Tsunz was eager to make a change in the political acceptance of Jews, 
and was actively involved in the emancipation process. He saw a problem in the discord of the Jewish society. So did his Eastern European masculine friend Rappaport. Tunes, an academic, uh, Rappaport, traditional educated, they both wanted to reveal the specific values of Jewish history and literature. For their very particular reasons, Tunes in German and Rappaport in Hebrew. 1832, Tunes quoted Rappaport 110 times in his over 500 pages long groundbreaking book, Die Gottesdienstlichen Vorträge der Juden, which copy he sent to Rappaport in Lemberg and received an extensive thank you letter five months later. Tunes would never hide his appreciation. And like the evidence in the footnotes, it belonged to his ethical creed to mention his sources. His investigative approach, which left off his uh, thousands of pages in archives, earned him a reputation of an acribic scholar, a collector, or an antiquarian, as his close friends Isaac Marcos Joost wrote in his Neure Geschichte der Israeliten in 1846, clearly to Tsun's disappointment. Rappaport surprisingly never criticized Tsun's, though he did criticize bluntly others, and sometimes even to his own disadvantage. In his uh, scholarly contribution to the history of Jewish literature, Rappaport developed his own and often ridiculed style of writing while using methods and arguments of the rabbinic tradition he was brought up with. His Miktavim, Zen Schreiben, are complicated essays in which then he quotes uh, his sources and assumes that the reader knows them. This information flow must have been a problem even for Tsunz while reading Rappaport's letters. Despite complaining over years that Rappaport wouldn't write often enough, uh, Tsunz also complained it took him a week, in fact, sometimes even months, to answer Rappaport's letter. During the 1830s, within eight years, Tunes wrote to Rappaport 60 letters, mainly research-related. There are gaps during the 1840s, maybe because of the personal and political challenges they faced, or because they met in person. Their bond lasted throughout the years. Rappaport's closest friend in Galician, Nachman Krochman, inherited to Tunes his unfinished writings for publishing without ever seeing him in person. The opinions on Yalko Chimoni before 1843 followed mostly Tsun's Gottesdienstlichen Vorträgen. Soon after Rappaport's Miktaf uh, review with acronym KM, which stands for Rafael Kirchheim, praised the new achievements of the critical school of Kerem Hemet. He communicated regularly with Rappaport regarding editorial issues and in the Literatur Blattes Orients, he criticized Lutzato's contribution about Shimon Kara. And despite the full quotation of Shimon Kara in Rashi, he disagreed with Rappaport. Kirchheim contradicts his own conclusion and finds some conjectures of Rappaport's analysis incorrect. Other than that, he praises uh, Rappaport for information on the Alkut prints and about Luria's opinion on Rabbi Abuna de Senderi. Far less detailed than Kirchheim, uh, Zacharias Frankel, the chief rabbi in Dresden and the later director of the JTS in Breslau, wrote about Rappaport's Miktaf in his Zeitschrift für die religiösen Interessen des Judentums. He considers Rappaport's conclusion on the origins of the Alko in the 11th century as correct. Certain confusion comes in mentioning of Alko by domestic Landauer, in the connection with his research on manuscripts in Vatican and Munich, but he passed away 1841 and he didn't know Rappaport's final argumentation. Some other opinions, uh, which were clearly not based on particular research and did not analyze Rappaport's reasons at all, like for example of Abraham Geiger in 1847, delivered no new evidence. It may seem that the topic was discussed extensively by the amount of mention, but despite that Yalkut was very often used as a source in treatises, not many scholars uh, search for the evidence to prove its origins. Needless to say, the strongest objection against Tun's uh, 13th century thesis delivers Tun himself. He clearly, maybe too clearly, quotes Rappaport's conclusion on the 11th century origins of Yalkut in his Zu Geschichte und Literatur in 1845, two years after Rappaport's Miktaf in Kerem Hemet. 
This makes any assertion about Sun's dating Yanko Chimoni in the 13th century simply deceptive. The discussion continued further after Rapoport's death and without Sun's participation. In the 1860s, the research on manuscript in general came into the focus of new research strategies. Therefore, it is important to mention uh, the bibliograph and scholar Moritz Steinschneider, a student and admirer of Zunz and a friend of both. He mentioned already 1859 and later 1877, the dating of Jakob Chimoni to the 11th century was correct. Although he didn't elaborate, but he mentioned Rapaport would have saved himself a lot of work if he would have had known the Editio Princeps from Saloniki 1527, respectively 1521. However, still ambivalent opinions followed like Nehemiah Bruce, who concluded 1883, I quote, it is not sure if the author of the Alcott lived in Frankfurt or if his name was Shimon at all. Quote end. Finally, the discussion took a rather surprising turn by Abraham Epstein, a controversial personality from Rappaport's past. In 1891, in the Hebrew periodical Hachoker, 24 years after Rappaport, five years after Zunz, and a few months after Gretz passed away, Epstein contested Rappaport's thesis and uh, Rashi's quotation as wrong and ignored the responsum argument. A problem here for today is uh, rather an outlook for further research. In the next step, uh, most of the researchers followed Epstein, and by that they not only ignored uh, Rapoport's contribution, but also Tsun's decision to accept Rapoport's research. At the end, we would like to show you the visualization of some of our data that have, we have been handling in our project and how the relationships and mutual influences worked. For our project, we also collect and analyze a fair amount of uh, biographical and bibliographical data from the archives and from the articles and publications. We are using the data management program note code um, and use its interactive tools to visualize uh, the contents we are working with. Here is just a glimpse of a geographical dimension of Rappaport's correspondence. And as a sample for today, we have the animation of correspondence between Suns and Rappaport over the years. It includes also Rappaport's correspondence with others who were sometimes in contact with Suns. The green notes are the letters which we know or we know they exist. The transparent notes are the persons. If you follow the timeline below, you can see the growing correspondence between Tsunz and Rappaport in the 1830s, but also the more in, in and outward letters of Rappaport after 1840 when he received the position of the Oberjurist in, in Prague. Then again, there is an increase of letters during 1850s with Tsunz and outward communication of Rappaport after his publication of Erich Melin in 1852. There are some letters more uh, after he became the chief rabbi in Prague in 1860, and finally a decrease after 1861. The click creates the red highlights on the particular connection. And if we scroll on the left, uh, we can see uh, or search for some other senders and receivers by name. We have Luzato there. Gretz, Krochmal, um, Bloch, or Steinschneider. Uh, we can see then also uh, their uh, connection in with Rappaport in the animation, the highlight threads again. And uh, back to the linear view, there are the particular letters with dates and names. The note code program uh, gives here a new possibility to get a fresh view on the relationships and how they developed in the context and over the time. Thank you for your attention and we are looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. <laughs>